Good day and welcome to the Pharmacy Summer Institute. My name is Alfred Ryman. I am the compounding instructor here at the State University of New York at Buffalo School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. We're standing just outside room 130, which is the compounding laboratory. Let's go inside for a closer look. There are 74 student workstations in this laboratory, along with this front area where announcements and instructions can be delivered. Compounding is the facet of pharmacy practice where the pharmacist has to not only dispense medication, but where he or she also has to make that medication as well. Students in the second professional year of our program in this setting learn the art and science of pharmaceutical compounding. In the next few minutes, I'll be giving you a virtual tour of our facility, the compounding laboratory where we are now, and also the sterile preparation area where our sterile preparations, intravenous products, if you will, are compounded. After that, we'll come back together and I'll show you some examples of the various dosage forms that we make in this laboratory. We'll start here at the back of the laboratory and just take a walk through here. As I said, there are 74 individual workstations in this laboratory, and the student is individually assigned to one of these stations. We are able to divide our class into two parts, given that we do have 74 workstations. And typically, during normal times, on a Friday morning from 8 to 11, we'll have one half of the class in here. We usually call them Group A. And then uh, Group B students are uh, the ones that meet on Friday afternoons from 1 to 4 p.m. So it's out here that we do the non-sterile type of compounding that I mentioned. We make things like capsules and suppositories and suspensions and ointments, and the list goes on and on. But uh, as I said, this is the, this is the non-sterile part of the laboratory where we do that type of compounding. So here's a typical workstation. The student has a stool. They have a computer workstation there. They have a balance. They have a hot plate. They have various types of basic chemicals in, on the shelves and in the cabinets that you see here. Uh, as I said, we start off uh, making uh, non-sterile products and we eventually end up in the IV room. And we're going to see that here in just a few minutes. Uh, when making capsules, for instance, there's really nothing novel about capsules as a dosage form, but when a capsule needs to contain a medication that uh, is not commercially available, or is perhaps not commercially available in a strength that is required by the patient, it falls to the skills of the compounding pharmacist to compound that medication so that the patient can have what they otherwise wouldn't be able to have. So it's in this setting, as I said, that students learn the art and the math intensive science of pharmaceutical compounding. So just continuing our tour here, walking through the lab. Again, this is all the non-sterile compounding area. We do have a series of sinks where students uh, can obtain, uh, can clean their glassware and uh, obtain sterile water. Uh, we do have, I should say, distilled water. We have distilled water on tap. Uh, sterile water we have in the IV room and we'll show you that as well but this is typically one of our sink clusters that we have we have a collection area for student products and uh, a storage area we have refrigerators strategically located throughout the lab that we use for products that need to be refrigerated we do have a storeroom behind that door and going back into our analytic testing area this is where we grade student products. We have balances. We have a mass spectrometer and uh, for analyzing the content of the products that the students make. So here's some of our balances right here. Moving along, we have additional hood areas and additional areas for student product assessment and grading. We also have an advanced compounding elective course that is, a, that is available to our students in the third professional year of our program. And this is a storage area, area for some of the materials for that course. And going back out into the laboratory now, the non-sterile compounding area.
Again, here's the sink areas that we have available to the students for cleaning their glassware and other tools. This is a front teaching workstation that we already had a look at. And now we're going to enter the sterile preparation area. There's three parts to this area. This uh, first entryway is known as the ante room. And this is where students come accompanied by a proctor one-on-one -on -one with a teaching assistant. And this is where they select the drugs and IV solutions that they need to compound their sterile products. And once they've done that, they're then escorted into the sterile preparation area itself. This is the IV room where we have several laminar flow hoods. Uh, the ones that you see here up against the wall, these are vertical flow hoods intended for the preparation of chemotherapeutic products. This is one of the pick stations that we have for students where they come to select their needles and syringes. And this is an up close view of one of the vertical flow hoods, otherwise known as a biologic safety cabinet, specifically intended for the preparation of chemotherapy and other hazardous materials. This is another and that is our third biologic safety cabinet. We have a number of hoods that are instructional only. They are not functional. Uh, this is a laminar flow hood. It's intended to simulate the operation of a laminar flow hood, a horizontal flow hood. So this we refer to as a fake hood sometimes. These are three actual real laminar flow hoods, horizontal flow hoods that are intended for the preparation of conventional IV products, those that are not chemotherapeutic or hazardous in nature. And then back out into the ante room. And behind this door is the third area of the sterile prep area. This is just a storeroom for IV bags and drugs and so forth. And then we'll go back out into the laboratory. And now I'd like to give you an overview of some of the products that we actually compound in the laboratory uh, to give you an idea of the types of things that are extemporaneously compounded in a pharmaceutical setting. In this exercise, we will fill a series of size number one capsules, each with 400 milligrams of powder. As a first step, and before going any further, the desired number of capsules should be counted out, lined up side by side, and compared to see if they are all of the same size and variety. Because on occasion, stray capsules of random type may mistakenly become mixed with your stock. There is no better time or opportunity to identify and replace any offenders. This precaution can save you lots of trouble down the line. So here on the pill tile, I have placed some lactose powder. It could just as easily represent some carefully blended trituration containing APIs, otherwise known as active pharmaceutical ingredients and excipients. But in this case, for the purposes of this visualization, we are just dealing with pure lactose. Once again, let's start off by making sure the balance is leveled and switched on. Next, place a properly formed weighing paper on the pan, then select one of the carefully examined size number one gelatin capsules and place it on the weighing paper, which in turn is on the balance pan. Next, press the tear button and release. The display reading will go to zero and the stability symbol will soon appear. Now in effect, the masses of both the weighing paper and the gelatin capsule are electronically subtracted from the display reading. So if a powder is added to the capsule, it is only the mass of the powder that will be measured and displayed on the balance. 
Gelatin capsules consist of two parts. There is a cap and a body. The inside diameter of the cap is just slightly larger than the outside diameter of the body. This allows the body to telescope into the cap to form the assembled capsule that you now see here. Please note that the body is significantly longer than the cap. Now remove the teared capsule from the balance. I will now use a spatula to gently pack the powder mass into a flat cake. Separate the cap from the capsule body. Initially hold the capsule in a horizontal position just off to the side of the powdered cake. It doesn't matter if you do this left-handed or right-handed, whichever is most comfortable for you. We will now scoop horizontally across and within the powder. This will fill the capsule with relatively loosely packed powder. Rotate the capsule to a vertical position with the capsule opening facing down towards the pill tile surface. Pick up the capsule and move it to an undisturbed portion of the powder cake. We're going to push the opening down into the cake with a slight radial twisting motion as you do so. This is sometimes referred to as punching. This is the first stage of compression. Now place the cap back on the capsule body loosely. Don't squeeze too hard just yet. The parts are designed to lock together if sufficient force is applied. We won't be ready to lock the halves together until the capsule contains the correct amount of powder. Use a chem wipe or other means to remove any residual powder that may be adhered to the outside of the capsule. Place the capsule back on the balance, wait for the stability symbol to appear, and observe the measurement reading. So here we can see that our capsule contains 513 milligrams of powder. Since our stated objective is 400 milligrams, we must remove some of the mass. Therefore, take the capsule out of the balance, once again separate the cap from the body, and remove a small amount of powder. Reassemble the capsule, place it back on the balance pan, and observe the new measurement. Looks like we now have 429 milligrams. We've made some progress, but we're not done yet. This is a trial and error process that may need to be repeated several times. So we go back and forth, adding and subtracting mass until we get a reading that is within plus or minus five milligrams of the stated objective. When filling a capsule in this way, Generally, plus or minus five milligrams is considered generally acceptable. Now we'll take a look at various types of mortars. This first one, along with its pestle, is made of glass and is referred to as a glass mortar. They come in many different sizes and capacities, from two ounces or less all the way up to 32 ounces and beyond. Due to the very smooth surfaces involved, a glass mortar is generally used for the trituration or mixing of two or more powders rather than for the reduction of particle size. That's not to say that particle size reduction doesn't sometimes occur in a glass mortar, just that it's usually not the intended purpose. Glass mortars are generally used for mixing or triturating powders that are already in a highly refined state, that is to say those already having small particle diameters. Next on our list is the Wedgwood mortar. This type, along with its corresponding pestle, has rough, porous surfaces and is generally employed when particle size reduction of dry powders is essential. The abrasive texture allows for quick reduction of otherwise coarse powders to those which are soft and non-irritating to topical application sites. Trituration using a Wedgwood mortar can be an efficient means to this end. This is a porcelain mortar and pestle. It has smooth surfaces similar to that of a glass mortar. In most ways, it can be used interchangeably with the glass mortar. One notable difference is that porcelain mortars tend to have greater volumetric capacities than glass mortars. Porcelain mortars are commonly used in the compounding of lotions. In this demonstration, our objective will be to measure 7.7 .7 milliliters of liquid. We will use a 10 milliliter pipette to accomplish this. With the bulb attached, squeeze out some of the air perhaps up to one half of the bulb's volume. Now place the pipette's lower opening, which is otherwise known as the tip, into the liquid that you intend to measure. Release the bulb and observe the fluid as it rises into the pipette. Allow the fluid to rise into the uncalibrated area above the zero mark to about halfway between the zero mark and the bulb. When the fluid level has reached this uncalibrated region, 
remove the bulb and quickly place your thumb tightly over the opening. Now partially release your thumb from the pipette opening until the fluid level begins to fall. Now modulate the pressure of your thumb in this way until the fluid level decreases and arrives and stops at the zero graduation. Move the pipette so that the tip is directly above the vessel into which you intend to place the measured volume. Release your thumb from the opening. The meniscus will begin to fall. When it gets to within one milliliter of the desired measurement, in this case at about 6.5 to 6.7 milliliters, place your thumb back on the opening to gain control of the fluid level. Modulate your thumb once again until the bottom of the meniscus approaches and stops at exactly the 7.7 .7 milliliter graduation. We have now accurately measured 7.7 .7 milliliters of fluid into our holding vessel. Again, practice this technique until you have full confidence and control. Semi-solids, otherwise generally known as ointments. In this particular example, the patient is to receive and self-administer an ointment product consisting of 10% sulfur precipitant in petrolatum. So here are 10 grams of refined sulfur precipitant and 90 grams of petrolatum. Place these items side by side, but separate from one another, on the ointment slab. Begin by pressing the petrolatum from the top down into the sulfur mass. Move the spatula to a slightly different position over the sulfur and press down again. Repeat this a few times until most of the sulfur is engaged with this initial amount of petrolatum. Then use a side-to-side -side action of the spatula to complete the process. The object is to form a smooth, homogeneous paste of the sulfur precipitant with a minimal amount of the petrolatum. Once all of the sulfur has been incorporated and exists as a smooth homogeneous paste with no lumps or other objectionable variations in texture, the levigation process is complete. Place an amount of petrolatum on the spatula which is roughly the same size as the levigated mass. Then through spatulation, thoroughly combine the two into a single mass. This has in effect doubled the incorporated mass. Repeat the process, effectively doubling the incorporated mass with each iteration. We now have the task of transferring the product to a dispensing container, in this case specifically an ointment jar. Remove the cap and then with a fair amount of product on one side of the spatula, place the tip of the spatula all the way to the bottom of the ointment jar. Do your best to contain the product and not allow any on the threads of the container. Repeat the process, adding more and more compound to the container. For pharmaceutical elegance, it may be necessary to smooth out surface variations using a metal spatula. Finally, also for pharmaceutical elegance, the inside circumference of the jar should be wiped clean with a chem wipe or other low particulate disposable dry wipe. Now, let's approach the hood. We'll initially place the plastic bin just inside like this, and then we're going to remove the contents, placing everything on the surface of the work area at least six inches inside. And then the proctor will at this point most likely take the bin from you and remove it from the hood. Line everything up neatly from left to right. Now for this first exercise, the object is to aseptically transfer five milliliters of this commercially available liquid IV drug solution that's here in this vial over to the IV piggyback which in this case is a 100 milliliter normal saline bag. So line everything up neatly from left to right. Here is the 100 ml normal saline bag. Place it on the work surface along with all of the other required items. Start off by removing the cap from the IV vial. So once you do have the top removed, take a 70% isopropyl alcohol swab tear it right down through the center and remove it from the packaging by one of its four corners using your thumb and first finger. Place and hold the vial on the work surface with one hand and then with the middle finger of your other hand, press the swab into contact with the latex rubber stopper and then pull towards you with firm downward pressure as you wipe the stopper's surface. Now let's take another alcohol swab and let's pick up and recognize the additive port of the IV bag. This is the additive port, and this is the administration port. 
It's the additive port that we use here in the pharmacy to make volumetric additions to the bag. The additive port also has a latex septum, similar to an IV vial. It does need to be sterilized in the same way as the IV vial top. So, holding the IV bag with one hand, push the alcohol swab into firm contact with the septum, and then in one, two, three, slightly different locations of the swab, sterilize the septum of the additive port. Now, let's rotate the syringe and needle to a horizontal position and orient it in such a way that the bevel of the needle is facing upwards. So now, we're going to move the needle and syringe over into position, again with the bevel of the needle in the up position, and I may want to mechanically stabilize my hand by resting my little finger on the surface of the work area. And again, it really doesn't matter if you do this left-handed or right-handed, whatever is most comfortable for you. I happen to be left-handed, so I'm using my left hand. Now I'm going to use my right hand to stabilize the IV vial, and the idea here is going to be to bring the tip of the needle over into contact with the center of the latex rubber stopper of the IV vial. We're then going to push down on the syringe needle assembly, causing a slight bow in the needle. We're then going to rotate the needle to a vertical position, causing that downward force to become lateral force. And the purpose here is to prevent the heel of the needle from coming into contact with the latex rubber of the IV vial top. The heel, with respect to the needle shank, forms a sharp acute angle. And if this sharp surface is allowed to come into contact with the latex rubber as it passes through the IV vial top, it will shave off portions of that latex forming cores that potentially could become integrated with the IV product. Let's review this one more time with the aid of this animation. We're going to start off with the needle and syringe in a horizontal position. We're going to move the needle over into contact with the center of the latex rubber stopper of the IV vial. We're going to push down with moderate force causing a slight bow in the needle. This is downward force that as we rotate to a vertical position becomes lateral force. This lateral force prevents the heel of the needle from coming into contact with the latex of the IV vial top as we push the needle into the vial. Now let's turn everything upside down so that we have the syringe on the bottom and the IV vial on the top in an upside down position. So now I'm going to push the plunger of the syringe from the 5 milliliter point that it's at right now all the way to the zero position. And keeping the tip of the needle below the surface of the fluid at all times, I'm going to release the plunger and allow the positive pressure in the vial to push the plunger from the zero position to some positive value. Now again, keeping the tip of the needle below the surface of the fluid at all times, I'm going to pull the plunger back to a position that's slightly more than 5 milliliters, perhaps 6 milliliters. So almost invariably at this point there will be air bubbles in the syringe that are adhered either to the plunger tip or to the inside circumference of the syringe barrel. So using your thumb and middle finger of your other hand, snap the syringe barrel with your finger in order to dislodge the bubbles and so that they rise into a collective airspace at the top of the syringe. So now I'm going to push the plunger of the syringe so that the bubbles exit out the tip of the needle and back into the IV vial. And once we've done this, we should have a slight excess volume in the syringe. We're then going to push the plunger until the syringe is registered at the dose volume, which is 5 milliliters. Now, we'll turn everything upside down, placing the bottom of the IV vial on the surface of the work area, and we'll pull the needle out of the vial. So now, I'm going to pick up the IV bag in such a way that I have good control of the additive port between my thumb and my first finger. So bring the tip of the needle over to the center of the additive port septum. Make sure that the axis of the needle is lined up with the axis of the additive port tubing as you prepare to begin to push the needle directly in, straight in, to the additive port septum. So let's grasp the thumb rest and finger flanges of the syringe, and we're going to push at a rate of about one milliliter per second. We're going to push the plunger from the five milliliter point where it is, all the way down to the zero milliliter mark. So now we'll pull the needle out of the bag and place the syringe down on the surface of the work area. 
So now let's lay the IV bag down on the surface of the work area and let's bring the tamper seal into the picture. We're going to peel the tamper seal off of its backing by grasping the head area and then just pulling it off of the backing like this. We'll then pick up the IV bag with our other hand and initially just tack the tamper seal onto the back side of the additive port like this. Now position your hand in such a way that the additive port is between your thumb and first finger. This position should also give you a good grasp on the tamper seal. We're then going to grasp the head of the tamper seal with our other hand and fold it up and over and down and position it in such a way that our thumb and first finger are now grasping both the back of the tamper seal and the front head portion of the tamper seal with the additive port in between. The way the tamper seal is now, there are two wings, one on the left hand, one on the right hand side. We'll need to fold these tightly down onto the additive port tubing, like this. And when we're done, we have a tamper seal arrangement that looks appealing to the eye and that will function adequately to detect any tampering with the product.